Okay, uh, now Tani, can you remember the first thing you said to me before you set off? I'm going to have 50 meters. Can I have 50 meters nice and easy warm up? I was very firm and said no. Why do you think I was so firm? You um, probably thought, oh, you're annoying man. Why because did you, <laughs> you didn't want me to go past. Pardon? You didn't want me to go past. You didn't want me I to wanted get to sort of see what you naturally would do at the start of a race. Yeah. So many times, I was talking to the coaches about this yesterday, many times swimmers have this idea of warming up well before a race, etc. But nine times out of ten, sometimes you're just restricted in the fact that you can't warm up, yeah. not in the water. You have to just go straight to the start line, the gun goes, and you're off. And um, we've already identified that, you know, you've got a very good swim speed, but for some reason, we're dropping off quite significantly over the course of a race. So what we normally see, even when I instruct you to swim steadily here for 200 meters, we might go up a little bit too quick yeah. here. So let's actually just see the first uh, 50 meters. So we're pushing off the wall. Coaches, I'm just using the little uh, scrubber down the bottom here. So that's two and a half seconds is when Tanya's pushing off the wall. And she comes through the first 50 meters. Just reaching it there in 40 seconds. So she's swimming up the pace here steadily of 1 minute 15 per 100 on that first 50 meters. Okay, so that might might help us a little bit later on. Now, did we all look at Tanya's stroke and think, oh my God, how are we gonna correct this? Because it's actually looking really quite nice. It's technically a very, very sound stroke. We know that you're a great swimmer, you come from a strong swimming background. But tell us a little bit about your shoulder. Um. Well, what's happening is that I don't have any problems with my shoulder, especially with it. Swim, I do have a problem sort of build up um, point here and sometimes here, and then eventually, let's sit in the let's sit, I'll stop feeling well, I'll, I'll just feel it's anomalous a bit, and sort of, and I know it's a nerve that's trapped there. Sure. But it's, it's Have you actually that, trapped it? Or are you I don't know, it's just something I said if I stop swimming for a bit, it's that's fine. kind of going completely. You've got the wet suit, it's okay as well ish. So it's now, manageable. Do you receive any massage at all? Yeah, I do. Yeah, okay. Do. How regularly? Um, well, not that often because I'm usually on tiny myself with stretches and. Do you have a ball? ball. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay, that's a good thing. So, but, the balls, especially in that area, so we're actually just showing us around the tight yeah, here. So, yeah. if we just pop this arm out in front of you, classic shoulder pain and impingement often comes from a thumb first entry into yeah. the water and it can be felt at the front of the shoulder, but it can equally be felt at the back because it's actually stretching this neural tissue. So the, fe the sensation that you get in there of like a, like a trapped nerve or what have you and coming all the way down here can actually be referred to because of the thumb first entry into the water. Now you can see from Tanya's stroke that she didn't have an absolutely mega obvious thumb first, but it's just enough to, uh, to cause a little bit of discomfort. When somebody's been swimming pretty much all their life and training a lot as a, as a kid, we were talking about it yesterday on the ASA program they'll teach a thumb first entry into the water, but when you're... 10 years old or 11 years old, you've got amazing levels of flexibility in your shoulder, you can pretty much get away with those sort of things. Not to say it's right, but swimmers in that age category can get away with it. So let's take a, uh, a little I'm look. I'm going to try to rotate a bit more because I used to breathe one side, right, right. side. Okay. So when I, and obviously because of that, I, sure. I feel that I'm rotating it more to the right, so when I'm doing three rather than to the left. Yes, yeah. So when I'm really trying to, like when it starts, Thinning, yes. I was like, okay, fine. You have to exaggerate rotation to the right, absolutely, to the left, sort of to, to help it. Just to, but and what yeah. you what you typically see is when somebody is very unilateral. We saw this in a few of your swim strokes yesterday, coaches. Is that somebody breathing to one side will typically push down with a very straight arm. In your case, with the left arm to breathe to favourite side, the right, and that can also put a lot of pressure on your shoulder here. Now, I'm pleased to say that you're not doing that. You've actually got a pretty reasonable catch underneath the water. So let's just take a little look at it here and see what we reckon. Now, here we're swimming at around about 76 strokes per minute, I think it's what most of you are sort of saying, yeah. 75, 76 strokes per minute. And Tanya's got a beautifully adapted freestyle stroke for the open water. It's that very sort of straighter arm recovery that we talked about. Even though it's straighter arm over the top of the water, she still comes into the water and enters into the water very, very nicely indeed. So it's like the ideal style, in, in our opinion, for open water swimming, especially when wearing a wetsuit, okay? Now, let's look a little bit closer. She's getting good clearance. Spearing into the water here very nicely, but if we come back down from this position here, let's take a little look in here. Now, this is the left hand look coming into the water. Let's just zoom in. This left hand, right upon hand entry look, comes in come first. So, that's probably the cause of what's happening here. So, I would continue to work with the massage and getting, uh, getting a little ball in there. That's an excellent thing to do. But we need to make sure that this hand entry comes into the water consistently fingertips first. 
Now, there is a company over in the US called Thumbs Up Swimming, and they quote us on their website saying, hey, swim smooth say, don't enter into the water thumb first. We're going to do the complete opposite and go thumbs up into the water to relieve, alleviate any strain on the shoulder. But what do you think happens underneath the water if you've got thumbs up? Yes, you just shear through the water. You don't get any catch at all. Correct, under the water. Yeah, it's not... It's not something I'd advise. What we're looking for is a neutral position with the fingertips first into the water to allow the swimmer to actually get the catch working so maybe well. maybe use as a drill just to teach that to the difference? Yeah, I mean, in extreme situations, yeah. you know, if you're halfway through a race and it was starting to feel very uncomfortable, but you would really compromise your catch yeah. if you were to do that. So I don't recommend thumbs up. Definitely not. Okay. And but here, well, yeah, just a little bit of a shimmy out to the side there looks quite good. And we can see here that Tanya is actually setting up for a good catch and pull through. Now there is some crossover look with the right hand. Obviously hard to see this from the side of the pool, but we can see there quite clearly look, the hand crossing over, and then this left one. The left one actually doesn't cross as much, but if we continue that trajectory straight forwards, we end up getting this intersection point about just over a meter in front of the head there. Now in an ideal world, if we bring on our Mr. Smooth animation, John Van Hazel, or the guy who used for the animation. And if we look at him from the top, we see that his hands extend straight forwards in front of the same shoulder. And we'd maybe, you know, if we continued these lines down the pool, we'd maybe get a little bit of intersection point, maybe about 15, 20 meters in front of him, but not a meter in front of the head there. So one of the things that we need to try and work on today the first exercise, we'll do the same exercise that we did with Graham yesterday, the side kicking and just thinking about drawing the shoulder blades together and back. So this drill sequence here, the coach had saw this yesterday. I'm not sure if you've done this yourself before. Yeah. Got a simple exercise. Exactly. Now, normally this drill is taught to improve rotation, to get the rotation even to both sides. We're going to do it today to try and actually get you thinking about keeping that lead arm straight forward in front of you. And the way to do that is to think about drawing your shoulder blades together and back. So you see how you, yes, good. See how naturally there, we're quite rounded. As we're sitting forward, we're hunching forward, we're all doing this, Tanya, but in this position here. Now you don't need to arch the lower back and put too much emphasis. It just wants to be a subtle drawing together of the shoulder blades. And even feel like you're actually drawing them down, that's it, to so just reduce a little bit of tension then to please this. So that's a good posture in the water there. Now we'll take that a little bit further. I notice you've got the Finney's freestyle or the pointy paddles in your bag. So the drill that we did with our uh, swimmer yesterday, we took it one stage further and did what we call the javelin drill, where you'll kick, oops, kick on the side with that pointy paddle on the lead hand. 25 meters kicking on one side, just thinking about a good posture. And then we go 25 meters freestyle, just breathing away from the paddle. Okay. Now these paddles one are uh, one side, only breathing one side, because the idea of only having the one paddle on is we can just focus on what this arm is doing without having to be too worried about what the right arm is doing, and then we can repeat the exercise on the other side. Makes it much easier just to focus on one side at a time. And for Tanya, the paddles also not only is going to help with the crossover, but because of the keel on the underside, if we slacken that strap off enough, if you do happen to pierce into the water come first, then the paddle's also going to become displaced as we go into the water there. Now, like I say, compared to most people enter into the water thumb first or cross over into the front of the head, Tanya's stroke is really not that bad at all, but it is enough to cause a discomfort in the left shoulder and consistency of a training would be potentially compromised because of that. You said that you feel it most when you're wearing a wetsuit in the open water. That's just really because of the restriction of the neoprene around the shoulder joint there. Okay, now let's take a uh, slightly different angle underneath the water here. What do we reckon is one of Tanya's strongest features within her stroke? Good really good body position. Really, really good body position in the water. Now, you're currently using a wetsuit that we design, the Xena, which is actually more designed for swimmers with slightly sinky legs. Yeah. And yet you've got absolutely brilliant horizontal body position in the water. So much so that I'd be concerned that with a slightly more buoyant leg of the suit you've got there, that we might Slowly actually kick down. it inside down because we might actually pivot too high at the back and end up kicking thin air. You notice as well, Tanya's also got quite a strong six feet leg kick. So that's a bit unusual. A pure swinger, a pure swinger would often have a two beat leg kick. Okay? So maybe from the background that you had as a kid with the sprint events, etc., you developed that six feet leg kick. You know what's happened though, as I developed it, because what I, I used to be a very lazy kicker. Yeah. And when I used to go um, 
I, I recorded somebody on the mm. floor and asked to record myself. But I found, especially when I'm breathing, my legs having scissor kick. Yes. So what I start doing, I start concentrating a bit more on a kick. Sure. Not on a kick to kick, but on the legs keeping, keeping together. Just yes, on yeah. a breathing special point. So I know that when I'm breathing point, I'll kick. And I feel my thumbs, but the legs are together. Right, so okay, that's yeah. where it's coming from. And then I found, I kind of start developing. So I, I did kick every fourth legs and then three legs naturally. And eventually, it's just I find it's much easier to do it like that, just to flap a kick. Like, I'm yeah. not tired, sure. but I, I know that then I'm stopping it, so that's right. kind of where it's came from. Absolutely. Now, it'd be quite interesting. Tanya can obviously do a two-beat kick. You mentioned that in, yeah. your, um, in your thing, and I was talking yesterday about swimmers who should and shouldn't switch between two and six feet. I think for the benefit of the coaches on the side of the pool here, it'd be good to actually see you switch between the two yeah. and see how seamlessly you tend to do it. What we'll start to see, no doubt, is that the stroke rate will come up a little bit yeah. with a two-beat leg kick. And it needs to do that. So just as a good visual reference for you, probably one of the best swimmers that we filmed with a good two-beat leg kick is uh, Shelley Taylor-Smith uh, from Australia. So you tend to push off the wall, sorry, Shelley tends to push off the wall with the same kicking style that you've got here. And then Switching. she switches into that two-beat kick. Now we've got to be, uh, we've got to remember, uh, be cognizant, I guess, of the type of racing which um, Tanya's doing. She's primarily racing over sprint distance triathlon, 750 meters, where you could argue that a slightly, slightly stronger leg kick wouldn't compromise necessarily her energy consumption. The two beat leg kick here may be a little bit more appropriate for 1500 meters, or if you were to step it up to half iron and a full yeah, iron. Yeah, I'm doing half. Doing half, yeah. So it'd be quite good to see you switch and change between the two there. That, I've just mentioned yeah, that you've yeah. just got, just gone through that there, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, something to uh, something to look at. So that would be a good timing for the uh, two-beat leg kick, how it should be performed. We'll notice in comparison to Shelly, the difference in your ankle flexibility. Yeah. So, if you look at Tanya's ankle flexibility here, much less than Shelly's. It's strange though, because when I'm sit, I can sit, okay? Yeah, but when can, I swim, yeah, yeah, yeah. it just suddenly, when I'm relaxing, that's what happens. Why do you think your ankle flexibility might not be quite so strong as Shelly's? So now, to be honest, I'll say if I Very stretch, simple answer. What sport do you do and what sport does Shelly do? All right, so I'm She's a pure swimmer. Yeah, You're doing triathlon, yeah. So for this, the level of flexibility, it sounds like I'm criticising Tanya for not having enough flexibility there. But because of her background in triathlon and the running, you need ankle stability for running, otherwise you constantly roll your ankles. So I would actually rate that as a triathlete as pretty good ankle flexibility on the most part. And she's just showing me here. Just do that again for us. That level of flexibility, she's not got stiff ankles, okay? Maybe stiffer relative to Shelly, who's a pure swimmer, but for triathlon, you're actually doing quite nicely with that. Just, just bring it up to show you as a comparison there. Totally. That's right. Now let's say, we'll come back to the side position in just a second. Let's just watch you from the from the front here. So that's that slight pitch of the thumb first on that left hand side into the water. Much straighter, much more neutral on the right hand side. And it's only a very slight thing, yeah. look. It just comes in, no, yeah. it comes it's slightly fine. up towards the surface. We drop the elbow, we end up just sort of pushing down a little bit to the surface, down towards the bottom of the pool. But then Tanya gets into quite a nice position here, engaging that catch and pulling through. And if we watch this from a truly head on position, just watch the uh, last lap here, look. Look at that. Yeah. Very, very nice catch and pull through. So we obviously discuss up in the classroom, we even discussed you over breakfast this morning, believe it or not, um, <laughs> that chances are we're going to see a stroke which is technically not a million miles away from where it needs to be. So very good angle at the elbow. Let's compare to double Olympic gold medalist Rebecca Adlington. <laughs> Kind of like favorite. I'm not, I don't watch like somebody it? with somebody, yeah, the um, BMW, BMW video. I think that's absolutely brilliant. Oh, I haven't, I haven't seen that actually. Oh, you have to. Yeah, there we go. Look, side by side with Rebecca. Almost side. In fact, look, exactly. I did 104 degrees. Yeah. Nice work. <laughs> okay. Now, let's see how consistent that's the it is. Watching, see? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> let's watch this one here. Look. So, right arm. It does a little funny shimmy at the front. It's a breathing side. Yeah, exactly right. So, it's a little bit of pushing down at the front end of the stroke. But then she gets into a nice position here. And again, 119 degrees. This hand maybe just sweeps a little bit underneath the body. Just watch what Rebecca does here. Hand stays out a little bit more underneath that shoulder. 
and then sort of comes in towards the hips there by the end. So generally speaking, I'm actually really pleased with what I see with this uh, catch and pull through. We can certainly do some drills. I mentioned that, you know, both- see that hand, if you just go a fraction back, back just a fraction, the bird one. Just again, just I sort of sweep. Sw uh, there, see, yeah. it, it, interesting position, just kind of going slightly to the side. That's right, yeah, yeah, coming in there. So we can still, obviously, the drills, somebody was asking the question, um, is it Nikki about uh, about swing types and running different sessions, etc. Yeah. Well, we've got we've got eight lanes here, but let's say we had a six lane squad going. In theory, you could run a session where you had a lane for the Arnie's, a lane for the Bambinos, and it'd be a subtly different session. But you'd find you'd still find that 75, 80 percent of the drills that you'd be doing would still be very similar. You'd just place a slightly different emphasis on why the swimmer's doing it. So even though Tanya's got a very nice stroke, she'd still benefit from coming along to a squad technique session where we may be looking at a couple of drills for sculling, a couple of drills for catch and pull through, just to sort of keep that feel for the water there, basically. But you can argue, uh, this will be the best catch, I guarantee it, this will be the best catch we see this weekend. It's very nice, very, very nice indeed. Okay, now, what's also nice from this angle is that underneath the water, your exhalation is also pretty consistent. Is that something you've thought about in the past, or? I, this it used to be a backstroker, really. Okay. So, and I, and a backstroke, I found that I have to hold sometimes. Oh, okay. So uh, it's not natural, and it's coming in general. If I'm racing, I have to think about it. Do you think so in that first hundred meters you might be holding on to your breath uh, at that point and you're going out quite quickly? No, I really. It's kind of part of my mental recuperation. That's good. I, I just yeah, do yeah. in the breathing exercise because you're not allowed in the water, so I'll be really doing. <laughs> Right, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. So just to think about it, but it's something that, especially I'm getting tired, I just have to concentrate more and more and more just that exhalation. Sure. Um, and if you if you notice, sometimes it's the weird pattern. Sometimes I'm pulled a bit for the first stroke, and then I try to go hang out second. So yeah, sure. it's 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 a, it's not easy. No. It's cool like that. No. So even though Tanya is at a very good level of development within a stroke, what we will start off today is just a couple of very basic exercises down at deep in the pool, just to try and get that consistency there, yeah. and just try and make, make you feel a little bit more relaxed, which may or may not help us at the uh, at the start of um, start of event. I'm confident um, just a little bit of tuning up there will help. So we can see that stroke's looking good. Um, one other thing to mention. It's nice to see you breathing bilaterally here. During a race, do you stick to that or do you tend to revert back to breathing to I'm the right side? I'm sometimes traversing. I'm sometimes doing 3-2. I'm trying... Oh, 3-2, yeah, yeah. yeah, okay, yeah. Sometimes does everyone know what she means by that? Yeah. So it's quite a good stepping, step up process between somebody who normally breathes just to one side. So they go one, two, three, take a breath. One, two, take another breath to that side. One, two, three, one, two. So they're still getting the benefits of the bilateral breathing. But that whole discussion and argument of the discussion, probably a better word, or debate we had yesterday about bilateral breathing, is, you know, it's got the benefits of what we're saying about the symmetry in the stroke, but the argument for getting more air into the system is, is, is there, and that's a, a really good thing. Because again, uh, as a shoulder, finally, if I start cruising one side, that would up. Yes, so exactly. You do that throughout the race, do you? Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 I may do a couple of times, so I just really feel it, but then I'm, I'm really switching back. Yeah. And that's exactly the same yeah. example I gave yesterday yeah. about my English channel swim. Yeah. My, prefer my preference side is breathing to the right. I breathe bilaterally all the time now, but on that particular swim, when the boat was sheltering me, I had to move more to the right than to the left, and sure enough, my left shoulder started to, yeah. started to go. So it's one of those easy modifications you can make to somebody's stroke, you know, aside from what we're going to do with this, you know, this fun first entry. Now, just with that in mind then, what we're going to do, we're going to go into the water and do some general drills just to try and tune up the stroke. Yeah. Try and stop you crossing over, try to get that left hand entry into the water a little bit better. Um, one of the best drills to do that is if we've got it here. We've got the uh, this unco drill. Now one of the one of the drills to actually um, improve somebody's general rhythm and timing within the stroke and just ensure that the hand entry comes into the water correctly is what we call the unco drill or the punco in this case here. Have you ever tried this one before? Yeah, I did. You tried that? Yeah. I don't find it. We tried it with a paddle. Uh, no. So these pointy paddles, we've already mentioned that they're good for making sure the hand entry is straight and not not from first entry into the water. But even if you take a step back from that, a very traditional single arm drill, which would be left arm out in front of you, pulling through with the right, 
taking a breath on each stroke and just literally placing the emphasis on trying to get into the water. Yeah, hand, hands in front of the shoulder, but making sure that left hand entry comes into the water, fingertips first, that would be good to do. So I'll yeah. lead Tanya through the development process for the MK drill, which you'll benefit from, certainly. Um, and, uh, and so we'll go through the single arm drill and then onto the Unco. We'll do a little bit of work on just a little bit of sculling, general feel for the water. And we'll use this as, almost like as a preparation. Think of this as Tanya's warm up to what's coming at the end of the session, which is a nice little CSS test. Yeah. Because from there, I'm very happy with what I see within your swimming. Yeah. But really to make this, the most gains forward for Tanya, we need to maybe address what she's doing from the training side of things. We'll go back up to the classroom and we'll be a little bit prescriptive with the type of sets that you can do and show you how to really make the most bang for your buck. And I'm not sure if everyone caught that. When you sat down, you said when you go training, you're not training for fun, I think you said. You just, you've always got a... Yeah, I've got something. I'm kind of I'm what's called old thinking. Okay. So... Um, Would you say you're very goal orientated? If I gave you the goal, for example, of hitting some times and... Um, yeah, and I'll try to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I really try to do it. Um... But then I'm extremely competitive with people kind of can guess. So I, yeah. I, I, I like winning. So I'm <laughs> when you're on the top of the um, age group sort of um, um, level, then uh, yeah, you kind of. And, and now it's, I found it's people just expected to win. So sometimes it's just putting unnecessary pressure on training it. So pressure when you think it, you know, everything can go wrong. Uh, and it posted on Facebook saying, I'm racing there. I said, Oh, you don't need a lot. I need a lot. So it's kind of, I find myself a bit trapped in the okay. Alistair Brownlee circle when everybody thinks, well, it's not winning, then something is wrong. Sure, So, sure. Uh, yeah. But, um, now, you mentioned that you've used the tempo trainer, yeah. but you primarily use it for stroke rate. Yeah. Tanya says she even actually races with the, with the tempo trainer. And you tell us about the numbers that you tend to... Uh, well, I kind of, I'm kind of putting it eight to turn. 82, yeah. For uh, seven picture and so probably what do you do about at the start? 80. I'm doing it up, I think, about 90. I'll try to work it out, but about 90. So you're sort of almost ignoring it in the first... Absolutely, yeah. I'll, I'll so she's ignoring the beeper in the first 100, stroking above that, and then settling after back down to about 82. So... One in the, the wetsuit, so... In the wetsuit, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah we're slightly it's quicker slightly. with the wetsuit, yeah, exactly right. So what we saw there of 76 is fairly reflective yeah. of, of what you would be doing. Now, one of the things that we're going to do today is going to ascertain what your threshold pace is. Okay. okay. Now... To do that, we'll do a 400 meter time trial and then a 200 meter time yeah. trial. Now, not only are we going to take simply the 400 time and the 200 time, but I'm also going to look at the, the splits that the swimming does over the course of the 400, and that'll be very useful for us a little bit later on. We can then work out what your threshold pace is and then give you a very prescriptive training program to show you how to actually get that a little bit better. Yeah. So rather than using the tempo trainer on stroke rate necessarily in some training sessions, I'll get you to use it per 25 on the cycle basically. Yeah. And, uh, and that will be hopefully quite motivating. Do you do the majority of your swimming by yourself? Or? Yeah, small sets where I find this is very um, helpful. Very motivating, yeah. yeah. I'm a, I, must, I swim almost entirely by myself. So all my coaching is done in the morning. I swim at lunchtime entirely by myself. And I've used that over the last five years just to gradually and slow, sorry, slowly and surely start to chip away at those times and get, uh, get better. Now, threshold pace is 1,500 metres speed. Okay. Tanya's swimming at 750 but working out someone's threshold pace, threshold pace is beneficial to anyone swimming distances of 400 meters and above. It's when you start to break between anaerobic and aerobic. So once you start to get into that aerobic sort of level of training, 750 meters, still working out the threshold pace for 1500 will allow us to to, uh, to benefit for the 750 as well. Okay, Especially from the pacing side of things. All right. Okay, so that's what it looks like. Yep. We're going to get into the water. Yep. We no, don't need a massive overhaul. I'm sure you can all appreciate that. And we're, now we're going to... Did you miss all that at the start? Or? Oh, we're getting, yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah, 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 yeah. So I, when you said with the, uh, with the wetsuit before, and, um, the, we will obviously have a look, little look at, uh, at Tanya's um, kicking between the, four, uh, between the six beat and the, uh, and the two beat. Yeah. It might well be, like you say, for 750, that the, two, that the six beat kick is more suited, but given the fact that you're moving up to 1.9k, It'll be interesting to see how you go with that. It's kind of one of those experiments when, when you have enough time, like 750 or one and a half when you swim, and you swim, you eventually start to within the group and you think, okay, well, let's try an experiment. I'll start kicking a bit more. What's yes. going to happen? So I found that uh, sometimes the continuous kicking is slightly faster than two sure. kick for me. Have so you tested it objectively? Oh, uh, I do have a long time. Yeah. Time. It'd be interesting to do that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. cool. 